Hello and welcome back to IdeaSex, where we take an analytical lens to mysticism and spirituality. Today we are continuing the conversation about spiritual awakening, and we're focusing on what I would call the linchpin of a spiritual awakening. It's sort of like the most important part, and that is healing. We're going to talk about uh, how our individual healing affects the collective shift, the planetary shift that we talked about in the last video. We're going to talk about <clears throat> why healing is the linchpin of a spiritual awakening. We'll cover uh, what it really means to heal. And then we'll talk about the three layers of an awakening, what I call the self, family conditioning, and societal conditioning. In the last video, we talked about how more and more people are having spiritual awakenings, and this collective shift in consciousness was actually prophesized about by uh, ancient cultures all over the world. And so there's there's been an idea that, that we humans have been throwing around for a long time about like peace on earth, right? And the, the idea is going from a place of operating in fear to operating from a place of love or what if we wanted to borrow some new ageisms, 3D to 5D, uh, old world matrix to new earth. So viva la revolution, bitch. <laughs> we live in legendary times because what's unfolding right now is literally written in our stars. And you and I get to be a part of it, which I think is so exciting. <laughs> also a little overwhelming uh, when, you, when we think about the sort of magnitude of something like this, but I take comfort in believing that we are only responsible for our own healing, right? We don't have to be responsible for anyone else's. We are not responsible for anyone else's, not the world's, not our families, not our friends, no one's, just our own. And this makes a surprising difference because reality is holographic. When something is holographic, that means that the whole is found even in, in the smallest piece. So if you ever had one of those holographic bookmarks as a kid, um, say it was had the image of an enchilada on it. You remember that bookmark with the enchilada? Say you cut it up into a million pieces and you took one of those pieces and looked at it through a magnifying glass. You would not see the crumb of an enchilada. You would see the image of a whole freaking enchilada if it were a true hologram. Or like think of Princess Leia in uh, Star Wars when she like projects and she's a hologram and she's like, help me Obi-Wan, you're my only hope. If we were to cut that into quarters, we wouldn't have four quarters of Leia. We would have four smaller, petite Leias. We can get into the science of that another time, but suffice to say that reality is a hologram. Oh, mind fuck. It's a fractal, which is why the spiral was such a sacred symbol to our ancestors. There's a Hindu myth about this, this holographicness holographicness, <laughs> that's not a word, of reality, uh, the legend of Indra's net. And so Indra, the king of the gods, cast a net to create the world. And from this net, he hung infinite jewels. And in each jewel, all other jewels were reflected. And the idea is that if you make a change to one jewel, it's reflected in all the other ones. Now, let's take that idea of Indra's net and know that you are a goddamn jewel. You're a gem, honey. So even though what's unfolding right now in the collective is fucking massive, uh, we do play a small role, right? As above, so below. The macrocosm is re reflected in the microcosm. People have said it a thousand ways. Heal yourself, you heal the world. Uh, <laughs> that's more than a lame bumper sticker. It's actually kind of literal when we consider reality is a hologram. And so the idea is that when we do the healing on the individual level, we help shift uh, the collective from 3D to 5D energy. It's not easy, but um, I don't think we're called to the path unless we are fully capable of doing the work. 110% freaking capable. And once we've taken up the quest, we can't really help but to heal. And I think this is for two reasons. First, like we talked about in uh, the first video, the end goal of an awakening is enlightenment, right? Regardless of whether or not we ever actually get there, uh, once we've woken up, we're like compelled to move in this direction of love, unity, wholeness. And someone in the comments actually beat me to the punch here and made the connection between enlightenment and healing. I think she sums it up perfectly. 
The second reason that healing goes hand in hand with an awakening is that uh, we become very aware of our own bullshit. We're literally becoming more conscious. And as that happens, an almost side effect of it is becoming conscious of one's bullshit. And this is key. Healing is so much more than recovering from bad things that have happened to us. Healing, I think in the broadest sense, is clearing out the thoughts, emotions, and beliefs that don't serve us. If this is starting to sound familiar, like I'm talking about the ego, I totally am because I never shut up about it. The way I think of it is like this. Our brain is a computer, it's hardware, and it runs programs. Most of these programs are subconscious, and during a spiritual awakening, when we're literally becoming more conscious, a bunch of this shit gets dragged up to the surface. And when that happens, uh, when these things come to light, there's often this moment of, who the fuck coded that? How did it get in here? Why do I have that? And a huge part of that answer is our family lineage and society. We all inherit programs from our family. We're all handed programs by society, and they're not necessarily good for us. In fact, some of them can do a lot of damage, which we will get into. All of this requires healing. So healing isn't just healing from autobiographical events, right? Someone died, our heart was broken, someone betrayed us, we were shamed, these painful events that we all experience at some point in our lifetimes. It also involves becoming conscious of any program that doesn't serve us and replacing it with something we code ourselves. Someone doesn't have to be going through a spiritual awakening to do this kind of work for themselves, right? I say work for ourselves instead of work on ourselves. It has a more like positive connotation to me. If you do something for yourself, you're rendering an act of service, you're giving something. If you work on yourself, you're trying to fix something, like there's something wrong with you. I digress a little. So again, you obviously don't have to be going through a spiritual awakening to do this kind of healing, but you are always doing healing work throughout a spiritual awakening. When we're on this quest to a better, higher place, we just can't help it. For example, we may become aware of the family dynamics and childhood wounds that continue to play out in our adult lives, or feelings of shame and inadequacy that are a result of our society making us feel like we're never enough. We even inherit generational trauma from our ancestors. And we may never become conscious of all of this, but during the spiritual awakening, a whole lot of it gets dragged up to the surface, which is why people who have studied this, people who have tried to document it, there are some, I'm starting to find them, uh, they often describe healing as something that happens in layers. And my favorite book on this so far is The Spiritual Awakening Guide by Mary Mueller Chaton. And she gives us 12 layers, uh, a whole dozen layers, I like to keep things simple, and so after, after cross-referencing a bunch of this stuff, boiled it down to three, which are the self, our family lineage, and societal conditioning. This video is going to be less of a how-to uh, rather than like how to heal, because that's, that's, that's more than a video. Um, this video is more talking about the layers, because we can think of it almost like Russian nesting dolls, and each layer kind of has its own wounds. And I think it's helpful to have context around each of these. And so uh, this is more of a contextual video than a how-to guide, but we will get into the how-tos. We'll talk about everything from psychology to energy healing, uh, shamanism, past life regression, you name it. Today, just the self, the family lineage, and societal conditioning. And actually, in the interest of this not being another 40-minute video, we're only going to focus on the first layer because it kind of stands apart. Starting with the layer of the self. Um, not like an onion. Okay, we're not ogres here. We are cakes. Slightly fucked up cakes. The layer of the self is the one that we are all familiar with because it involves processing or making peace with the things that have happened in our past. And so this, this layer is very conscious, right? We have memories of the things that hurt us, so we know where we need to heal. And this actually makes it much different than the other two layers we're going to talk about. The other thing that's unique about the layer of the self is that it is so, uh, so connected to our physical body. Any kind of trauma or strong emotions we experience in our lifetime is stored literally in our bodies. And mystics and healers have known this forever, but it wasn't until recently that the West started to take this idea more seriously. Not mainstream medicine yet, but most of the research being spearheaded around this is being done by psychologists. And a great 
A great book on this, a revolutionary book on this, is The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk, uh, Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma. And he shows a bunch of research about how trauma literally reshapes our brains and bodies. So he focuses on how emotional stressors, uh, negatively charged experiences actually affect us physically and physiologically. Nobody can treat a war or abuse, rape, molestation, or any other horrendous event for that matter. What has happened cannot be undone, but what can be dealt with are the imprints of the trauma on body, minds, and soul, the crushing sensations in your chest that you may label as anxiety or depression, the fear of losing control, always being on alert for danger or rejection, the self-loathing, the nightmares and flashbacks, the fog that keeps you from staying on task and from fully engaging in what you are doing, being unable to fully open your heart to another human being. And when I read this, the first thing I thought of was how um, especially Eastern healers have been telling us this forever, that emotions have a direct impact on our physical bodies, right? So in something like Chinese medicine, uh, certain emotions can cause illness in certain organs. And he actually addresses this. He references it just a couple pages later. Some 80% of the fibers of the vagus nerve, which connects the brain with many internal organs, are afferent. That is, they run from the body into the brain. This means that we can directly train our arousal system by the way we breathe, chant, and move, a principle that has been utilized since time immemorial in places like China and India, and in every religious practice that I know of, but that is suspiciously eyed as alternative in mainstream culture. Mainstream Western psychiatric and psychological healing traditions have paid scant attention to self-management. In contrast to the Western reliance on drugs and verbal therapies, other traditions from around the world rely on mindfulness, movement, rhythms, and action. Yoga in India, Tai Chi and Qigong in China, and rhythmical drumming throughout Africa are just a few examples. The cultures of Japan and Korea Peninsula uh, have spawned martial arts which focus on the cultivation of purposeful movement and being centered in the present, abilities that are damaged in traumatized individuals. Aside from yoga, few of these popular non-Western healing traditions have been systematically studied for the treatment of trauma. I think this is why so many people on the quest find relief in physical practices because our emotions and our physical bodies are inherently connected. Mainstream Western medicine mostly entirely ignores this fact because mainstream Western medicine is not meant to heal us. When you think about healthcare, right, our hospitals, big pharma, these things uh, <laughs> treat symptoms and not causes because they are for-profit systems. They make more money when people stay sick. That is not a conspiracy theory, that is an economic fact. If medicine were preventative and treated causes, global pharma would not be estimated to grow to $1.5 trillion by 2023. And so while I do think that things like psychology and psychiatry have their place, um, I think they can be very helpful. A lot of us don't find healing in those things by themselves. And that's when people turn to alternative practices. And it's funny, he puts alternative in quotation marks because in the mainstream, it's thrown around like it's, an, like it's a dirty word. And I find that a little bit ironic because when we think about the reason it's called alternative, it is an alternative to these <clears throat> standard practices that are not fucking working. If they were working, suicide would not have jumped 30% between 2000 and 2016, and that was pre-pandemic. So I'm, I'm not gonna get preachy today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try not to get preachy. Uh, and just wanna make the point that our physical bodies are very much connected to our emotional states. And so when we're working through the layer of the self, um, which is painful things that have happened to us in our lifetime, it is inherently physical, right? So the other layers um, are at the level of the mind. They're, they're more belief systems, but with, with our, ourselves, um, there's a very physical, literal component to this. It's not just hurt feelings, right? It is all the physical repercussions of things that have been difficult. All right, we're gonna get a little woo-woo here, but not too much. Um, there's also the possibility that during a spiritual awakening, we're processing past lives. And let me preface this by explaining why I think the idea of past lives are even worth entertaining. If you're into this stuff, great. If you're not, also great. There's timestamps for you. But the reason that I think this is an idea hat worth trying on 
is because there have been hundreds of counts of children who have remembered having other lives. And they'll say, you know, who they were, uh, who their family was, where they worked, and then be able to give intimate autobiographical details about these people's lives. And so some researchers uh, would take it upon themselves to go out in the world and verify these accounts. And what they found is that the children's accounts were accurate. To me, that's a very convincing case uh, for the possibility of something like past lives. And another thing that comes up in, in these stories is that sometimes when people die traumatically, they actually come back with physical markers of their death. So for example, if you were stabbed, you might come back with a birthmark where the blade entered your body. If you died in childbirth, you might come back with certain gynecological conditions. That's not to say that every physical ailment we ever experience is the result of past life trauma, right? That's definitely not the case. Um, but I think the interesting possible takeaway here is that if something like this is real, it would suggest that our energetic, emotional, non-physical body bodies have an impact on our physical bodies. And can't verify this, but I think it's an idea hat worth trying on. Some people say that a spiritual awakening um, occurs during our last incarnation on this planet, which is why we are called to clear out trauma beyond our current lifetime. So past lives, maybe, maybe not. I think what is indisputable is that our uh, emotions slash energetic body, all of our unseen bodies are inherently connected to our physical body. We can almost think of the physical body as being like an outgrowth of our subtle bodies. And uh, this is why a lot of people experience physical symptoms during an awakening. And I've heard, especially in the early stages of waking up, I've heard it described as being like a purge. A lot of people will use this metaphor of like literally um, everything gets pulled up so it can be expelled. And uh, if, you know, that starts at, if, if we're holding on to trauma at this, um, this energetic or emotional level, when it comes up to the surface, it's coming up to the physical surface. And so during the first two years of my awakening, um, I was in and out of doctor's offices, hospitals, and I was convinced, convinced that I had a brain tumor or an autoimmune disease because I had all of these unrelated symptoms. I would have boils and rashes, and then those would go away. And then I would get these like swooning dizzy spells um, where I would see flashing lights. I would have episodes where my whole body felt like it was on fire. And probably my favorite was one summer I woke up and I could not turn my head. It was like I woke up with the worst whiplash of my life, like paralyzed here. Um, and no doctor could tell me what was wrong. And some people would call these symptoms of a Kundalini awakening. Some people would call if, if they're... Um, sort of theosoph the theosophical, if they're ascension-based spirituality, they would call these ascension symptoms. Um, some people would just call it spiritual illness, right? Language is a, is a tricky thing with this stuff because uh, it really hasn't been studied enough for us to understand it so well that we can put labels on it, if you get what I'm saying. So um, I don't think what we call it is as important as understanding that if we are on this path, we may very well experience um, physical symptoms that don't seem to have a physical cause. They seem to have an energetic or emotional root. I have a quote from Miss Mary here that I think puts the cherry on top of this idea. She just summarizes it really nicely. Physical sensations can be confusing because we do not always understand that spiritual, energetic, mental, emotional, and physical deeply inform and in fact create one another. Even when we do have this understanding, there is doubt that the physical stomach pain we are experiencing may be related to something on our spiritual path. So we go to see the doctor who gives us pills and a diagnosis or pills and no diagnosis. Not to say that you shouldn't like see a doctor, right? If you're, if you're experiencing something like be smart, be safe. Uh, just to note that sometimes um, if you're walking this path, you may have physical symptoms that don't seem to have a physical cause. So to summarize, by idea sexing between trauma research, Eastern traditions, and the concept of past lives, we can see how our uh, energetic, emotional, unseen bodies are inherently connected to our physical bodies. Because the layer of the self is so connected to our bodies, many of us find relief in physical healing modalities. And during a spiritual awakening, 
When all of this stuff is being dragged up to the surface so it can be cleared, we may experience physical symptoms. So the physicalness of this layer is much different than the other two layers that we're going to talk about. Um, what's cool about the layer of the self is we can tackle it from any angle, mind, body, spirit. The other two layers of this human cake take place very much at the level of the mind. And that's what we're going to get into next time. In the interest of not making this a 40 minute video, 20 seems to be the sweet spot. Um, I'm liking where the, the watch time and the retention rate is at right now. Also, I appreciate that people who watch this channel have actual attention spans. Fact, most humans have the attention span of a goldfish, like literally eight seconds. Y'all aren't fishes. You are, what did we talk about in this video? You are a cosmic, gem encrusted, divinely guided, infinitely worthy, multi-layered cake. Thank you so much for joining me on Idea Sex today. And until next week, stay blessed. <laughs> Three notifications. Are you a she-male? <laughs> that person literally asked if I'm a she-male. <laughs> I mean, yeah, dude, depends on what you mean. I got that big dick energy. <laughs> Are you a she-male? I'm gonna be thinking about that all day now. Cause it's so fucking true. Like, but I look like a woman. I look like a woman. I take care of people like a woman, but I get what I want like a man. You just never met a man who could throw it back like me. <laughs> Maybe you should do a she-male thumbnail. <laughs> 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 <laughs>